Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of Blue Leadership with your host, Dennis Nair. Uh, go ahead and hop into the chat and to let us know where you're coming from today. Um, Dennis is a 25-year law enforcement veteran and retired chief from the state of New York. He's also a proud graduate of the 240th session of the FBI National Academy and the 61st session of the FBI Lita Command Institute. Um, the Blue Leadership Video Podcast is brought to you by the nationally ranked Master of Science in Law Enforcement and Public Safety Leadership Program at the University of San Diego. You can learn more about LEPSL program at criminaljustice.sandiego.edu. And with that, I will go ahead and kick things over to your host to introduce our featured guest. Thank you, everyone. Kylie, as always, thank you and great to be back. And uh, today's guest, uh, we have Gerard Aslin from the Anchorage, Alaska Police Department. Um, I think this is going to be this will be great because, you know, a lot of people are used to, you know, policing and in on the mainland, and there are definitely some nuances. Um, Gerard is a, a deputy chief there with 24 years. He's started there at 21 years old, and um, and he um, was going to actually be able to share us just how the LEPSL program has tied into his promotional advancement and him doing his job and, and tons of things. So um, without further ado, Gerard, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, I guess uh, over to the East Coast. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet with everyone today and talk to you specifically, Chief, and uh, humbled to be uh, seen. I've kind of looked at the the array of folks that have attended before me and and uh, just honored to be a part of that. Yeah, and likewise, we're honored to have you. And, and we talked at the beginning, the, the hardest part of this podcast was coordinating all our time zones. You're in Alaska, four hours difference from the East Coast. And we coordinate with the University of San Diego, where this program is held, and they are three hours different. So, but we made it work. Um, what I'd like to ask first, Gerard, is the um, you, you're a graduate of the Law Enforcement and Public Safety Leadership Program at the University of San Diego, and you also recently just promoted to Deputy Chief of the Anchorage, Alaska Police Department. Again, that's a, a good sized department. You have 600 officers um, or 600 members, 400 or so sworn. You have a population that you police of about 293,000 people. Um, tons of responsibility. Um, I'm sure you're extremely busy with that. Can you just share for the listeners and viewers how the LEPSL program, one, set you up for the ability to promote into that high rank within your department? I mean, you're really number two, and the ability to now do the job as a deputy chief. Yeah, absolutely. I um, I can't overstate, you know, how relevant and timely the topics are within the LEPSL program. And and I would say, you know, that's probably the reoccurring uh, value and benefit is the immediate uh, and practical application of the curriculum as you go through. And so it, it as you said, I ended up uh, graduating just it was about a month after I promoted. So I had been through the program and had an opportunity uh, you know, very recently to delve into these issues so deeply in the program. And I think that coupled with my years of experience and kind of what I had already experienced at the department just allowed for uh, uh, greater conversation as the, you know, as we talk about the issues that we face. And so for me, um, you know, how did it help? I think that it allowed me to be able to, you know, speak intelligently for lack of a better term about about the programs and the issues that we're facing and how to best move the department forward. Um, and I, so it was you know, really relevant that way. And do you think in the selection process that because when people are applying for those high level executive jobs, there's a lot of competition. Do you think your master's degree from this program is what helped put you over the top? I think that it is an influencing factor. Um, I would say my process might be somewhat less traditional. You know, oftentimes you see uh, when particularly when there's a solicitation on a broader scale, there's a really competitive process and, they, you know, whittle candidates down and they do uh, public forums and such. For my appointment to the deputy chief position, it didn't involve a lot of that. And, uh, but I was able to speak about being actively involved in the program. And I think that that automatically leads some credibility to not only what I'm saying, but my ability and my interest to continually grow and improve as a professional. Um, and so I think, 
Um, it's, you know, to be frank, no one said, oh, you've got this degree, you must be qualified. I think more so it comes out in the way that you're then able to speak about the issues that matter most. And it carries with it a certain amount of weight and value. Um, and, and I think that's the largest impact that it has for me. Agreed. And, and I'm sure your chief and those in the selection process know that this person has a growth oriented mindset because he is trying to and did improve himself through that high level of education. And, and actually going back, so now you're a graduate session 276 of the FBI National Academy. Uh, I'm fellow graduate session 240. Um, to me, there was such tremendous value in that. And there's a lot of people that are watching who are maybe thinking about going into a master's program. And they're also a National Academy um, graduate or, or will be attending. You and I spoke offline and we both did the same thing. Can you just share how you um, proceeded with your course selection at the National Academy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, for me that I saw the NA not only as an individual opportunity to grow professionally through attendance at the National Academy, but I use that as a catapult to kind of restart my education. I had completed my bachelor's degree about 10, 11 years before you know, raising three kids and just a busy life. And I kept saying, like, I want to do that someday. I want to do that someday. I want to work towards that graduate degree. And it was percolating back there. And then when I when I started learning about the N.A., I was like, oh, you get college credit for that. And those college credits can potentially be transferred. And so I went into my course selection with the idea of earning graduate level courses. And it helped me in two ways. And I would encourage anybody who's who goes down the, um, you know, and, and is fortunate enough to go to the National Academy. It helped me in two ways. One is um, it because of the courses, I was able to get enough credits where through the University of Virginia, I got a graduate certificate in criminal justice. And, and that just, again, adds something to uh, to the resume, to your experience. But it's something to speak about. But then almost more importantly and direct to your question about Lepsel is I was able to use some of those credits that I had earned in the National Academy through the University of Virginia and transfer that into University of San Diego Lepsel program. And, and for me, that was a huge benefit. I was able to you know, take that time and apply it in a number of areas. Um, and so, again, I would encourage anybody they've got bachelor's level classes there and they've got graduate level classes take the classes, challenge yourself, and then use that as the catapult towards the future. Yeah, and I, I did the same. And, and when I went in 2010, um, I, there wasn't, the Lepsel program didn't exist then, but I knew that this is an amazing opportunity where I could do exactly that, take graduate courses. It's a little more work, a little more time, but I knew that that would help me that would help me to transition into a master's program. So I did exactly what you did. And then I had the graduate credits. And then when I saw Lepsel had partnered with the National Academy, and then when I saw it, it was in 2018, I said, I think this is the program for me. And the rest is history, but exactly the same. And hopefully anyone watching this will kind of take that into account if, if they have the chance to go. Take graduate courses because the University of San Diego, this program is awesome about accepting them. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, it was a pretty, um, pretty seamless process. I ended up taking two classes at the National Academy that were similar in, in, in uh, curriculum. So, you know, I couldn't transfer all the classes, but I was able to transfer three. And that's a big difference on a, on a 10 course program. Um, so, sure. yeah. And, you know, and I, I guess I would just push and encourage anybody who if you take that time away from your family, away from your job, and you're trying to grow as individuals to push yourself and to, to get as much as you can from the program while you're there and then later too, right? And we're talking about the later, but while you go, I took it very serious and I was there to learn. And, and um, you know, I, I would encourage everyone to take it as that because there is so much to be uh, obtained from the National Academy and then later as you apply it to the Lepsel program. Yeah, without a doubt, make it make it count. And and I'm going to talk about a little bit about the flexibility of the leadership program at Lepsol. But in terms of leader or the flexibility, but in terms of leadership from the National Academy, I, one of the things I remember, and, and this is something that on these podcasts I haven't been able to touch on, and this is the perfect opportunity. The the networking is huge. The education you get is huge, and then you could transfer it into a degree like Lepsol. Um, what other leadership skills do you think you acquired from your time at the NA that is helping you right now as you do your job as a deputy chief? 
I think for me particularly was the ability to be able to see and interact with police professionals from all over the world. Um, and one of the questions you alluded to, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but the, the difference of policing in Alaska, and one of the biggest differences, we don't have a lot of other agencies in which we routinely interact with. It's a pretty limited pool here. Um, we, um, so that ability to be able to go out and have deep conversations with people from, you know, police professionals from other organizations, I enjoyed not only talking to them, um, you know, those from the U.S. and what we call the lower 48. I think you called it the mainland. We call it the lower 48 states. Um, and from those from the lower 48, but then our international partners and that exposure to what you, you know, the way policing is done across the world. And so I guess direct to your point, Dennis, or your question about the leadership piece is that 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 variety of experience and different ways to approach topics. And when you're in a course and you get to to get to have those discussions about differing ways to do things. To me, that's a central component to good leaders. Is somebody who can who can seek information, seek viewpoints, kind of you know coalesce around an idea and then move forward. And so, for me, one of the biggest leadership pieces was just having that opportunity to interact with and see all of those different perspectives across the world. Yeah, for sure. And this is actually why why not segue right into that. The difference. In, in your policing, in addition to the leadership component, so Alaska obviously is is not the same as policing in the lower 48. And can you just talk about some of that? And and you and I we chatted a bit about just the difference in backup, the difference in 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 maybe the availability of other resource agencies. Can you just explain what you see as the main differences? Yeah, I think. Um... You know, I would I would say, first of all, let me just get this out of the way, because this is a common thing when I talk to people and they're like, you're from Alaska. Well, that's on my bucket list. And what I would say to everybody is take it off the bucket list, move it to the top. Uh, you know, we're, we're full full blown community here. We have all amenities uh, and I, I welcome all visitors to come to Alaska and, and explore all that it has to offer. The summer is absolutely beautiful. Great fishing opportunities. Uh, the, the sites are unparalleled. So we'll get that out of the way up front. Um, and then, and beyond that, so as far as differences, I mean, we, we do have a lot of the same, I would say all of the same challenges. In fact, I'm struggled to think about a dynamic that we see outside that doesn't come here or that hasn't come here. Um, but, but fundamentally we do have some differences. We talked about some of the logistical considerations. Um, we don't have a lot of overlapping and concurrent jurisdictions. Like, for example, yes, we have the state police, but they're out of the municipalities. We don't have county police, so we don't have deputies and, and that. So it really just comes down to local police, the state. And then like at our airport, in our local college, we have small departments, but pretty limited, um, you know, ability to be able to call for something. And what we always say is if something happens, it's on us. Right. We we as the largest police department in the state, um, uh, you know, we, we're it. Um, we might get a couple here, a couple there in the case of something really big. But if it's that big, I bet you those, you know, for example, we had a big earthquake um, and the state troopers were equally busy. And so was the airport police. And so we don't we have a lot of limitations that way as far as the other jurisdictions. We do have federal footprint here, just like every other big city. But again, those are smaller number, you know, smaller offices, not a lot of flexibility that way. Um, the other thing that you alluded to, Dennis, is the whole, the, the, uh, the, our jurisdiction that we technically have policing over is 1800 square miles. And so I think for most metropolitan police departments, they're probably in the double digit square miles. Well, we're quadruple. Now, admittedly, a good part of that is parks and, and, you know, undeveloped areas. But from a road mile standpoint, we go about 50 miles to the north through Anchorage, which is about 15 miles and then about 50 miles to the south. So our jurisdiction is really huge. And um, I think that's something that it definitely impacts the way we police, the way we have to staff our response times. And it's something we talk about with our community on a, on a frequent basis, because when you talk about staffing models and whether you look at, you know, call driven or per capita, 
the 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 the, the uh, you know makeup of the jurisdiction matters a lot, and and how long it takes you to get to every call matters a lot. And so we've got that challenge just based upon the vastness of because our city's really spread out. The other thing um, that I kind of alluded to in the NA discussion is this idea that it's a bit of a challenge for us to get people outside to and outside the lower 48 to national level schools and training because of the expense and the time where, you know, I see a lot of my colleagues outside, they'll just drive over to the next city, drive to the next state and pretty low cost, you know, you show up. And so we, we constantly have that challenge of being able to stay connected to the best policing, uh, you know, practices possible, uh, keep up on training. Um, and that's just because it, it's a pretty big commitment for us to, to send people outside to everything. Um, and so that's one, of, I think, a challenge that's somewhat unique to, to us up here versus some of my colleagues outside. Yeah, and it's interesting. And as much as in the profession, you you, you go across the country, um, lower 48 and Alaska, Hawaii as well. And, you know, you'll see that the challenges are the same, you know, especially in this day and age with the reforms and, and the um, public scrutiny and the expectations and doing more with less. I mean, those I think will be universal. But, you know, you look at some of the things having to 1800 square miles to have to, you know, police and and to respond to maybe a domestic incident, which may take an officer, would I be wrong in saying 45 minutes, maybe an hour or more to get there sometime? Uh, fortunately, based upon the way we have our beats broken up, um, you know, it's not going to take that long because we've got it spread out and we've got it covered. And so we'll have officers staffing particular parts. But, um, you know, 15 and 20 minute, 15 minute drive time, no problem, because Anchorage is so big and that's right in the city proper. Um, 20 minutes, no problem as well. But yeah, it's just the, it's just spread out. Yeah, and my municipal policing is we're in both cities, very densely populated cities. So we'd get fights in progress, assaults in progress. As the person's on a phone, we're rolling up to the scene. And again, just a difference that someone from a densely populated city going to somewhere like that would be definitely a huge, having a huge learning curve for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's just a, it's a, it's, different logistics that we have to keep in mind as we're, as we're, you know, striving to serve. I think one thing that, and you, you mentioned it, Dennis, I don't want to bring up, and it's more of a, it's frankly a, it's a commentary on our community uh, broadly, but one area where I feel like distance matters and it's beneficial to us is that when, you know, when things happen outside, um, when bad events occur, when there's an upswell, right? When Minneapolis happened, we had protests, but the protests we had, resulted in zero arrests. Um, you know, it was an opportunity for the community to come together, speak about it in a controlled way, convey the message, but we did not have a big upswell. And I, I think I think it speaks to a couple areas. One is, you know, overall and through the years as we've measured it, we have pretty good community support. And I think it's due to our, you know, our continued professionalism our continued um, agency culture of just trying to protect and serve in a you know professional way, and I think it comes out. But the other thing is, I, I when I watch some of the things that occurs outside, is again that proximity to to the problems. I think tends to get the outlying communities involved, and it almost kind of grows from one another. Well, we, we don't have that because we have distance and everything that's occurring is seen, um, you know, seen through the media, seen through social media. Um, it's it's not as though someone's going to drive, you know, from one city in Alaska to the other and say, hey, they're, you know, they're rioting over here. So let's do it over here, too. That doesn't we haven't had that. And I'm so grateful for my community and the way our department and our officers work. Um, and that's just one big change that I see or difference that I see. Yeah. Well. And, and, and that's huge because from the, the city that I recently retired from, we'd have people from neighboring cities knowing that there was going to be some sort of um, unrest and they would then come down and vice versa. They'd go to those other cities because within an hour, hour and a half, you could be in three or four major cities within New York state and, that that was something that we never even considered that that's a challenge you don't have to experience. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to take that as a good thing, sir. That is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I want to ask now, going back to your deputy chief role, what do you think that the biggest challenge for you has been in your assuming of that role that maybe 
you didn't think would be, or, or was there none? I mean, was it a, a seamless transition for you? Uh, seamless would probably be overstating it. Um, I think that there, everything that I've experienced in the last few months is not something that I hadn't contemplated, but it is, there's a few things that I'd like to, I guess, talk to you guys about that, that have been challenges for me. I uh, spoke about it, I think, before we started talking that we've, we got a new mayoral administration in July and the previous administration had been in place for six years. So having a new mayor, all his new administ you know, administration and directives and stuff, that has been a bit of an adjustment. We also, at the same time, got a new chief of police, and then I was promoted to uh, my now chief's former role as deputy chief of operations. And so you have a new chief in place. Um, and, and so I think the biggest challenge I have seen is just simply adjusting to and trying to work together to figure out uh, what are the priorities both from the city administration, from the new chief, and then how do we as a senior command staff work together to, to meet those priorities, right? Um, and the other thing, the other dynamic that's kind of percolating in the background there that has that creates some, some challenges um, is two things. One is, you know, a, a segment of our community that... Um, that uh, had you know, maybe in some respects not been listened to the same under the previous administration, because to be quite frank, we saw an ideological shift in our administration. They now have voice and they're now speaking directly through this administration. And so as a department, I think that it's important for us to, to work in a way that resonates and, is, and, um, and, and really answers the needs of the community that's speaking to you. And we've seen a little bit of shift in that. And so some of our policing, um, you know, uh, uh, priorities have had to necessarily shift because we've got a new mayor, we've got the community and a different segment of the community kind of speaking with us about what's important to them, new, you know, new chief. And then and kind of down from there is we have we have four captain positions and I was a captain. I promoted to deputy chief. I'm now working directly with the captains who were my you know, direct colleagues before, and now I have a superior role to them. And although I, you know, to me, that doesn't matter. You have to try to figure out how to work together with one another in those new roles uh, to try to continue to move things forward and advance these new directives. Um, and so I think for me, that's been the biggest challenge is just figuring out how do we coalesce together as a command team working with this city administration. Yeah, and I think for all those watching and listening, anyone would be in that same exact um, quandary or, or challenge, so to speak, because they would obviously have to, their new role would put them in a position where now they're, instead of a, a peer to um, the colleagues that they used to work with, now they're the superior officer. And how they go about doing it is so important because, you know, you want to have people willingly go along with the program versus having to drag them along. And I mean, it's just so much more productive when everyone's rowing in the same direction by choice. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, that has been some of that as we're navigating each other and then we're navigating, um, we're, we've, uh, we're developing a, a new crime and community engagement plan that's, that is responsive to those, those multiple kind of constituencies out there that are informing our work. And, and so as a command team, as we try to work through and solidify, what does this crime and community engagement plan look like? What does the structure of our organization need to be to be able to meet those needs and meet the vision and that those priorities? Um, that's that's a little bit of a challenge when you're all new to the game and you're all in new roles. And oh, Dennis, did I mention on top of that we're in our budget cycle? Uh, so we've got uh, you know thankfully this this administration has fully funded our budget, um, but there's been some you know, some discussions about shifting resources and of course, you know, cuts and streamlining of services. And so that's kind of been coupled in there, um, you know, with new people in the job and new vision and then trying to figure out the budgets as well. Yeah. You know, if you look at a main theme, it's really being able to continually pivot, to continually like to adjust and, and make sure your priorities are, are where they should be. And sometimes those priorities will shift. And you know, what's interesting, let's, let's go back to LEPSO, go back to that program. So during your time in it, um, there is a lot of flexibility and you have to adjust because you were working as a captain at the time you're in the program. Um, you're doing this program that, that requires a lot because it's creating the new leaders of law enforcement throughout our country. 
with the you know the the top education so you have to balance your family life your work life your coursework can you tell the listeners and viewers a little bit and you have an interesting story because you were able to actually kind of go off the grid on um some personal experience with your son and still balance all the hat and i know that a lot of that played a key role in your success and your what you're going to have is continued success in your current role as a deputy chief can you talk a little bit about that please uh yeah it's a, i i appreciate an opportunity to be able to speak about it in that way and that um you know it is a challenge and i think we all go into new adventures and new challenges and, and with a bit of apprehension right necessarily so and and, uh, and a couple of things about the Lepsel program specifically, the way that the courses are structured provide for success for working individuals. And the, the program is specifically designed to appeal to, you know, educated professionals in the field. And I saw a number of examples where, where the program was able to meet us where we were to serve us while we went along the journey. And a few examples of that was when COVID first kicked off, we had a little bit of programming change because, you know, the um, Dr. Fritzvold and the and the the group at Lepsel saw that we had some unprecedented, um, you know, encumbrances on our time. And as captain of patrol, I had a lot going on when COVID first happened, and 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 they pivoted the program to make it work for us. Um, when we when the riots happened, again, responsiveness on the part of of the Lepsel staff. And, and I'll talk to one specifically. We had one of our officers who was um, shot, uh, in, you know, uh, end up being, a, he was shot, um, OIS situation. And Dr. Fritzbold reached out to myself and we had one other, um, one other officer at my department that was in the program, emailed us both directly and said, look, I know that's a trying time for your agency. If you need any accommodations or adjustments, please just let us know. And it's those sorts of little things that make the program workable for professionals. Um, and specific to your what you alluded to about the opportunity that I had, um, both of my boys are actively involved in scouts. And um, I had an opportunity about a year ago to go to or sign up to, uh, for Philmont, Philmont Scout Ranch, Ranch in Cimarron, New Mexico. And, um, and so I reached out to Dr. Fritzvold months in advance. And I said, look, I've got this, what I see as a once in a lifetime opportunity to go on a hike for uh, 12 days with my then, you know, my 16 year old son. And I, I really want to do this. Is it possible? And unequivocally, the re response from him was absolutely family first. We'll make this, this thing work. Um, and so as I got closer, Dr. Fritzwald was my instructor for both my, it happened to be my last class too, Dennis. So I had capstone um, and one other course data and, uh, analytics at the same time. And so Dr. Fritzvold helped me out, worked me through that. We were able to work ahead on the capstone project and then also work ahead on the course material. So I would, you know, I just, it's those sorts of things that really exemplify how appropriate the Lepsel program is for, for professionals. And uh, I was able to go on a 12 day hike in the mountains of New Mexico, about 98 miles with a backpack uh, with 11 other scouts and adult leaders and had a, had a phenomenal experience. Um, and I, you know, I owe that in large part to Dr. Fritzvold and the Lepsel staff. That's awesome. And I am not at all surprised to hear that. And, and in my mind, I always knew just that Dr. Fritzvold and the Lepsel program would be completely accommodating should there be something important. And in my mind, I was able to do my job as a chief during COVID and the unrest and the reforms and just high crime rate, everything, because I knew if something got so out of hand, he'd be an email or a phone call or a text away, and I would be given the ability to have some sort of concession made where I would still do the work and get it done, but that there would be an understanding for the, for what was going on. And, and your story is awesome. And I think, I hope the listeners and viewers who are, maybe that's one of their reasons they may think, well, they don't want to start a master's program. If, if they want to start one, this is without a doubt the one to start because of not only the, the knowledge, but because of things like that. Absolutely. I agree. And yeah, just knowing, going into it, knowing that they're not lessening the standard, they're just modifying the timelines to allow you to be responsive to your personal and professional goals and needs. Right. And one of the things you spoke of, you mentioned the word capstone and um, from going through the program, we know what that is. And, and some people may be listening and 
they may not be a hundred percent sure. And I know your your capstone was one that was actually um, got a lot of accolades and was very well regarded. Can you just talk a little bit about what the capstone is and um, um, your your thoughts of of putting it together? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I think maybe I ended up with accolades because I modeled mine after yours. So uh, you did such a great job. You set the bar for us, and and I'm so I'm thankful for that. But uh, it's funny. I've actually looked at yours again since uh, originally. You know, since completing mine, and uh, and yeah, yours has continued to only get better. So thank you. Um, you know, for me, I I I really enjoyed the whole capstone process and and what it what it was for me and and you, you know the students will see they have some options about they can do build their own website they can build something in linkedin or they can build something in live binders and it's a it's an e, it's an e-portfolio something in which you can exemplify who you are both personally professionally and then the work that you've accomplished while in the lepsel program and on the surface i did i also thought oh this is a little bit daunting right this is a this is a big thing and I think necessarily so, but but for me, fundamentally, when I I decided to go the website route because I am somewhat active in in LinkedIn, and I didn't feel that that got me the growth that I wanted to learn something new because I felt like oh I could do LinkedIn that should that wouldn't be that hard. And I'll take the path of more resistance and build the website, um, and then Live Binders to me just didn't it didn't didn't resonate. So built the website. And what it represented for me um, was an opportunity to go through the entire 18 month program and look at everything that I had done. And, you know, as you're just as you're, as you're just working through the material and you're working through the classes and you're just living life, working your job and you kind of tend to a little bit forget about what you did months ago. Right. And so for me, the capstone, the best value of it was was going back and looking at every paper I wrote, every you know thing that I submitted. Um, and reflecting on that and then applying it and refreshing kind of my knowledge and being able to apply it to what I was doing at that point in time. And you know, I'll just use, for example, human trafficking. Now, we wrote a, an MOU as a team regarding human trafficking. And there has been a resurgence of interest on that here locally. And so I was able to like, oh yeah, that's right. I wrote that paper months ago. Here it is. And it's immediately relevant to the work I'm doing. And so I was able to put all that together uh, through my website to be able to, um, you know, display the work that I had done in Lepsel. Um, and I, I like the idea of being able to also show who I am as an individual, right. And showcase a little bit about my family, a little about where I come from, and then also what the Anchorage police department has to offer and the experiences I've had there. So it was a good reflection opportunity, I guess, to, to say it, you know, shortly. That's awesome, yeah, and and thank you for your kind words. I hadn't, I didn't know you, you saw mine, and 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 the backstory to that was when I asked Dr. Fritzfold, I says, what's the difference between, and I don't think LinkedIn was an opportunity or an option at the time, but it was Live Binders or a website, and I remember Dr. Fritzfold said, well, the website will be a little bit more work on the front end, but you'll get more value out of it because of whatever you may choose to do later on, or just to kind of highlight some things. And I was thinking, I kind of want to learn how to build a website, and I have done a lot that I'm really proud of in addition to Lepsel that I wanted to do exactly what you did, showcase it and put it in one place as kind of a compendium. So for me, that's what it, it became. And, and I kept it. I bought the domain name, just became DennisNayer.com. And now when I do these um, these Blue Leadership when I do these Blue Leadership podcasts, I can put them on there. But there's value, and I hope the listeners and viewers can, if if they're in the program or thinking of it, when they get to this, they should do it as thinking, where will it bring them later on? I remember Dr. Fitzfold said somebody was going to be running for sheriff, and their capstone became their website that they use for a lot of their, um, you know, their their election. So again, I, again, it was work, but it was like uh, I think that would be the true example of a labor of love, where you're really doing something that has such value and and it shows for everyone who watches it or, or sees it yeah and i i would again encourage people to try to get the most out of it if you're going to spend for me if i'm going to spend my time effort and energy on something i want it to be good i want it to i want it to have me grow i want it to help the organization i want it to you know get something out of it and so for me the website was just that because like you i had never built a website 
I had, um, I was involved in the, the formation of a nonprofit here in town and we talked about a website and it seemed daunting and someone pulled it off and I was like, look at that, that's neat. Right. And we recently had built a, a, a well-being initiative here at the department that I was helping, um, helping build. And again, someone said, yeah, I can build a website and it seemed so foreign to me. And then I did it I'm like, oh, I can do that. That's just, I, can, I can build a website. And my capstone allowed me to do that. Um, I do, I understood that Dr. Fritzwald said that they're using uh, my website in this most recent capstone course. Um, and so for anybody who wants to look at it, my name, Gerard Aslan backslash Weebly, and they can take a look because it is still there publicly available. Haven't made the big leap, Dennis, to get my my actual domain, but and, uh, but you can still find me, Gerard Aslan Weebly. And so for those who want to see it, I'm I'm leaving it there and I'm trying to update it and we'll see where it goes. That's awesome. I, I think, you know, what a good way to kind of start wrapping things up. I mean, just everything kind of comes full circle. We talk about having that growth mindset at the beginning and and really it, it plays out not just in your decision at the National Academy to take graduate courses, your decision to become a student, enroll in the LEPFO program and graduate and then be, become the deputy chief of the Anchorage Police Department. And then, I mean, just everything, it just seems that this program draws in people like yourself and people that just want to always improve. And, and whether it's, you know, to go on a 12 day trip with your son and, and still do your graduate work and, or to build a, a website first time from scratch. I mean, I just think this Lepsel brings out the best in, in all the students. And um, I think that's great. Hopefully any listener or viewer, if they had any apprehension, Hopefully this will kind of assuage that. And, and I just want to, Gerard, wrap up with what are your final thoughts for anyone who's watching or viewing just in terms of um, maybe ascending to to the ranks, maybe to get into that chief's title, uh, deputy chief, assistant chief, chief, um, your thoughts on what they should be doing right now? Yeah, a few things, I guess, that come to mind and and that um, that I, that growth mindset, right? Continuing to be a lifelong learner, I think, is uh, is extremely important um, in our profession broadly, regardless of where you're at within the organization. Continuing to learn every day, trying to make yourself kind of just one percent better is what I what the way I think of it, um, and just try to improve and continue to try to improve the work you do, the family that you have, the support systems around you. Um, and I think the number one thing that I would say to anybody who's looking to try to move up within an organization is to is to remain humble, do the work, do the hard work, let the work speak for itself. If you if you're trying to work for the position, it comes out differently than you're trying to do the work and let the position come. I agree. When when the position comes as a byproduct of just working hard, staying humble and, you know, being yourself and true to yourself, then generally that um, position um, has a lot more value. And um, Gerard, uh, Deputy Chief of Police, uh, City of Anchorage, Alaska, thank you so much. I know Kylie's going to join back in and close us out, but um, tremendous podcast. Thank you so much for your time. I, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, Dennis, you're doing, doing fine work here. I'm thankful for that. And uh, Kylie, thanks for setting it up for us. Of course. Yes. Great to have you. Um, and thank you to all of our viewers that uh, joined in today. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to meet the law enforcement heroes and leaders who are part of the MS Lepsel family. Um, if you'd like to watch previous episodes of Blue Leadership, you can find them on the video tab of our Facebook page or by searching USD Blue Leadership on YouTube. Uh, thanks, everyone, and we will see you all next time. Take care, everybody.